Part 1, Chapter 9b of The Adventures of Jimmy Dale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Jimmy Dale by Frank L. Packard. Part 1 The Man in the Case. Chapter 9b Two Crooks and a Knave continued. It was twelve minutes after nine when he drew up at the curb in front of the side entrance of the hotel. His watch, set by guesswork, had been a little slow, and he had corrected it at the club. He was replacing the watch in his pocket as he sauntered around the corner and passed in through the main entrance to the big lobby. Jimmy Dale avoided the elevators. It was only one flight up, and elevator boys on occasions had been known to be observant. At the top of the first landing, a long, wide, heavily carpeted corridor was before him. Number 148 the corner room on the right, the toxin had said. Jimmy Dale walked nonchalantly along, past number 148. At the lower end of the hall, a group of people were gathered around the elevator doors. Halfway down the corridor, a bellboy came out of a room and went ahead of Jimmy Dale. And then Jimmy Dale stopped suddenly and began to retrace his steps. The group had entered the elevator. The bell boy had disappeared around the farther end of the hall into the wing of the hotel. The corridor was empty. In a moment, he was standing before the door of number 148. In another, under the persuasion of a little steel instrument, deftly manipulated by Jimmy Dale's slim, tapering fingers. The lock clicked back, the door opened, and he stepped inside, closing and locking the door again behind him. It was already a quarter past nine, but no one was as yet in the connecting room. The fan light next door had been dark as he passed. His flashlight swept about him, located the connecting door, and went out. He moved to the door, tried it, and found it locked. Again, the little steel instrument came into play, released the lock, and Jimmy Dale opened the door. Again, the flashlight winked. The door opened into a bathroom that, obviously, at will, was either common to the two rooms or could, by the simple expedient of locking one door or the other, be used by one of the rooms alone. In the present instance, the occupant of the adjoining apartment had taken a room with a bath. Jimmy Dale passed through the bathroom to the opposite door. This was already three quarters open and swung outward into the bedroom, near the lower end of the room by the window. Through the crack of the door by the hinges, Jimmy Dale flashed his light, testing the radius of vision, pushed the door a few inches wider open, tested it again with a flashlight, and retreated back into number 148, closing the door on his side until it was just ajar. He stood there, then, silently waiting. It was Hamvert's room next door, and Hamvert and the weasel were already late. A step sounded outside in the corridor. Jimmy Dale strengthened, straightened intently. The step passed on down the hallway and died away. A false alarm Jimmy Dale smiled, whimsically. 
It was a strange adventure, this, that confronted him. Quite the strangest in a way that the toxin had ever planned. And the night lay before him full of peril in its extraordinary complications. To win the hand, he must block Hamlet and the weasel, without allowing them an inkling that his interference was anything more than, say, the lock of a hotel snake thief at most. The weasel was a dangerous man, one of the sleekest second-story workers in the country. With safe cracking as one of his favorite pursuits, a man most earnestly desired by the police, provided the latter could catch him with the goods. As for Hamvat, he did not know Hamvat, who was a stranger in New York, except that Hamvat had fleeced a man named Michael Breen out of his share in a claim they had had together when Breen had first gone to Alaska to try his luck. And now, having discovered that Breen, when prospecting alone somewhere in the interior a month or so ago, had found a rich vein and had made a map or diagram of its location, he, Hamvat, had followed the other to New York for the purpose of getting it by hook or crook. Breen's find had been too late. Taken sick, he had never walked his claim, had barely got back home before he died, and only in time to hand his wife the strange legacy of a roughly scrawled little piece of paper. And Jimmy Dale straightened up alertly once more. Steps again, and this time coming from the direction of the elevator. Then voices then the opening of the door of the next room, then a voice, distinctly audible. Pull up a chair and we'll get down to business. You are late as it is. We haven't any time to waste if we are going to wash pay debt tonight. Oh, that's all right, responded another voice, quite evidently the whistles. Don't use worry. The game cinched to a fade way. There was a sound of chairs being moved across the floor. Jimmy Dale slipped the black silk mask over his face, opened the door on his side of the bathroom cautiously, and without a sound stepped into the bathroom that was lighted now, of course, by the light streaming in through the partially opened door of Hamvert's room. The two were talking earnestly now in lower tones. Jimmy Dale only caught a word here and there. His faculties for the moment were concentrated on traversing the bathroom silently. He reached the farther door, crouched there, peered through the crack, and the old whimsical smile flickered across his lips again. The Palais Metropole was high class and exclusive, and the weasel, for once, looked quite the gentleman. And for all his sharp ferret face, not entirely out of keeping with his surroundings, else he would never have got further than the lobby. The other was a short, thick-set, heavy-jowled man, with a great shock of sandy hair and small black eyes that looked furtively out from overhanging bushy eyebrows. Well, Hamvert was saying, the details are your concern. What I want is results. We won't waste time. You are to be back here by daylight. Only see that there is no comeback. Leave it to me, returned the weasel, with assurance. How's there going be any combat. Mitchell keeps it in his safe, don't he? Well, gentlemen's houses has been robbed before, and this job will be a good one. The geography stunt yours once gets paged with the rest, that's all. 
it disappears. See? Who's to know yours gets your claws on it? It's just lost in the shuffle. Right, agreed Hamvard briskly. And from his inside pocket produced a package of crisp new bills, yellow bags, and evidently of large denominations. Half down and half on delivery. That's a deal. That's what, assented the whistle curtly. Hamvert began to count the bills. Jimmy Dale's hand stole into his pocket and came out with his handkerchief and the thin metal insignia case. From the latter, with its little pair of tweezers, he took out one of the adhesive gray seals. His eyes wearily on the two men, he dropped the seal on his handkerchief, restored the thin metal case to his pocket, and in its stead, the blue black ugly muzzle of his automatic peeped from between his fingers. Five thousand down, said Hamvert, pushing a pile of notes across the table and tucking the remainder back into his pocket. And the other fives here for you when you get back with the map. Ordinarily, I wouldn't pay a penny in advance. But since you want it that way, and the map's no good to you while the rest of the long green is, I... He swallowed his words with a startled gulp, clutched hastily at the money on the table, and began to struggle up from his chair to his feet. With a swift, noiseless sidestep through the open door, Jimmy Dale was standing in the room. Jimmy Dale's tones were conversational. Don't get up, said Jimmy Dale coolly, and take your hand off that money. The weasel, whose back had been to the door, squirmed around in his chair, and in his turn stared into the muzzle of Jimmy Dale's revolver while his jaw dropped and sagged. Good evening, Whistle, observed Jimmy Dale casually. I seem to be in luck tonight. I got into the room next door, but an empty room is slim picking, and then it seems to me I had someone in here mention five thousand dollars twice, which makes ten thousand, and which happens to be just exactly the sum I need at the present moment. If I can't get any more, I haven't the honor of your wealthy friend's acquaintance, but I am really charmed to meet him. You uh, understand, both of you, that the slightest sound might prove extremely embarrassing. Hamvert's face was white, and he stared uneasily in his chair. But into the weasel's face, the first shock of surprise dismay passed, came a dull, angry red, and into the eyes a vicious gleam, and suddenly he laughed shortly. Why, you damned fool, jeered the weasel. Do you think you can just get away with that? Say, take it from me, you are a picker. Say, you make me tired. What do you think you are? Do you think this is a theatre, and that you are a cheapskate actor strolling across the stage? I'll oh, beat it. You make me sick. Why, say, you pinch that money, and you have got the same chance of getting out of this hotel as a guy has of breaking out a sing sing. By the time you get five feet from the door of this room, we has the whole wax on your neck. Do you think so, Weasel? inquired Jimmy Dale politely. He carried his handkerchief to his mouth to cloak a cough and his tongue touched the adhesive side of the little diamond-shaped gray seal. Hand and handkerchief came back to the table, and Jimmy Dale leaned his weight carelessly upon it, while the automatic in his right hand still covered the two men. Do you think so, Weasel? he repeated softly. Well, perhaps you are right. And yet, 
Somehow I am inclined to disagree with you. Let me see, Wizzle. It was Tuesday night, two nights ago, wasn't it? That a trifling break in Maiden Lane, Atorold and Sons, disturbed the police. It was a three-year job for even a first offender. Ten for one already on nodding terms with the police. And fifteen to twenty-four, well, say, for a man like you, Weasel, if he were caught. Am I making myself quite plain? The color in the Weasel's cheeks faded a little. His eyes were holding in sudden fascination upon Jimmy Dale. I see that I am, observed Jimmy Dale pleasantly. I said, if he were caught, you will remember. I am going to leave this room in a moment, Weasel, and leave it entirely to your discretion as to whether you will think it wise or not to stare from that chair for ten minutes after I shut the door. And now, Jimmy Dale nonchalantly replaced his handkerchief in his pocket, nonchalantly followed it with the banknotes which he picked up from the table, and smiled. With a gasp, both men had straightened forward and were staring wild-eyed at the grey seal stuck between them on the tabletop. The grey seal whispered the weasel, and his tongue circled his lips. Jimmy Dale shrugged his shoulders. That was a bit theatrical, weasel, he said apologetically, and yet not wholly unnecessary. You will recall Stangeist, the Mope, Australian Ike, and Claridine, and can draw your own inference as to what might happen in the Torald affair, if you should be so ill-advised as to force my hand. Permit me, the slim deft fingers, like a streak of lightning, were inside Hambert's coat pocket, and out again with the remainder of the banknotes, and Jimmy Dale was backing for the door, not the door of the bathroom by which he had entered, but the door of the room itself that opened on the corridor. There he stopped, and his hand swept around behind his back, and turned the key in the locked door. He nodded at the two men, whose faces were walking with incongruously mingled expressions of impotent rage, bewilderment, fear and fury, and opened the door a little. Ten minutes, Weasel, he said gently. I trust you will not have to use heroic measures to restrain your friend for that length of time. Though, if it is necessary, I should advise you for your own sake to resort almost to murder. I wish you good evening, gentlemen. The door opened further. Jimmy Dale, still facing inward, slipped between it and the jamb, whipped the mask from his face, closed the door softly, stepped briskly but without any appearance of haste along the corridor to the stairs, descended the stairs, mingled with a crowd in the lobby for an instant, walked seemingly a part of it, with a group of ladies and gentlemen down the hall to the side entrance, passed out, and a moment later, after drawing on a linen dust coat which he took from under the seat and exchanging his hat for a tweed cap, the car glided from the curb and was lost in a press of traffic around the corner. Jimmy Dale laughed a little harshly to himself. So far, so good. But the game was not ended yet, for all the crackle of the crisp notes in his pocket. There was still the map, still the robbery at Mitchell's house. The $10,000 theft would not in any way change that, and it was a question of time now to forestall any move the whistle might make. Through the city, Jimmy Dale alternately dodged, spotted, and dragged his way, fuming with impatience. But once out on the country roads and headed toward New Rochelle, 
the big machine, speed limits thrown to the winds, roared through the night, a gray streak of road jumping under the powerful lamps. A village, a town, a cluster of lights flashing, flashing by him, the steady pour of his sixty horsepower engines, the gray tread of open road again. It was just eleven o'clock when Jimmy Dale, the road to himself for the moment, at a spot a little beyond New Rochelle, extinguished his lights and very carefully ran his car off the road, backing it in behind a small clump of trees. He tossed the leaning dust coat back into the car and set off toward where, a little distance away, the slap of waves from the stiff breeze that was blowing indicated the shoreline of the sound. There was no moon, and while it was not particularly dark, objects and surroundings at best were blurred and indistinct. But that, after all, was a matter of little concern to Jimmy Dale. The first house beyond was Mitchell's. He reached the water's edge and kept along the shore. There should be a little wharf, she had said. Yes, there it was, and there too was a gleam of light from the house itself. Jimmy Dale began to make an accurate mental note of his surroundings. From the little wharf on which he now stood, a path led straight to the house, bisecting what appeared to be a lawn. Trees to the right, the house to the left. At the wharf beside him, two motorboats were moored, one on each side. Jimmy Dale glanced at them, and suddenly, attracted by the familiar appearance of one, inspected it a little more closely. His momentarily awakened interest passed as he nodded his head. It had caught his attention, that was all. It was the same type and design, quite a popular make, of which there were hundreds around New York, as the one he had bought that year as a tender for his yacht. He moved forward now toward the house, the rear of which faced him. The light that flooded the lawn came from a side window. Jimmy Dale was figuring the time and distance from New York as he crept cautiously along. How quickly could the weasel make the journey? The weasel would undoubtedly come, and if there was a convenient train, it might prove a close race. But in his own favor was the fact that it would probably take the weasel quite some little time to recover his equilibrium from his encounter with the gray seal in the Palais Metropole. Also, the further fact that, from the weasel's point of view, there was no desperate need of haste. Jimmy Dale crossed the lawn and edged along in the shadows of the house to where the light streamed out from what now proved to be open French windows. It was a fair presumption that he would have an hour to the good on the weasel. The seal was little more than a couple of feet from the ground, and from a crouched position on his knees below the window, Jimmy Dale raised himself slowly and peered guardedly inside. The room was empty. He listened a moment. The black silk mask was on his face again, and with a quick, agile, silent spring, he was in the room. And then, in the center of the room, Jimmy Dale stood motionless, staring around him, an expression, ironical, sardonic, creeping into his face. The robbery had already been committed. At the lower end of the room, everything was in confusion. The door of a safe swung wide. The drawers of a desk had been wrenched out. Even a liqueur stand, 
on which were well-filled decanters, had been broken open, and the contents of safe and desk, the thief's discards as it were, littered the floor in all directions. For an instant, Jimmy Dale, his eyes narrowed ominously, surveyed the scene. Then, with a sort of professional instinct aroused, he stepped forward to examine the safe, and suddenly darted behind the desk instead. Steps sounded in the hall. The door opened. A voice reached him. The master said I was to shut the windows, and I haven't started to go in, and he'll be back with the police in a minute now. Come on in with me, Minnie. Lord! exclaimed another voice. Ain't it a good thing the missus is away? She'd have high hysterics. Steps came somewhat hesitantly across the floor. From behind the desk, Jimmy Dale could see that it was a maid, accompanied by a big, raw-boned woman, sleeves rolled to the elbows over brawny arms, presumably the Mittel's cook. The maid closed the French doors. There were no others in the room, and bolted them, and having gained a little confidence, gazed about her. My, but wasn't he cute, she ejaculated, caught the telephone wires he did, and ain't he made an awful mess. But the master said we wasn't to touch nothing till the police saw it, and to think of it happening in our house, observed the cook heavily, her hands on her hips, her arms akimbo. It will all be in the papers and maybe they'll put her pictures in it, too. I won't get over it as long as I live, declared the maid. The yell Mr. Mittel gave when he came downstairs and put his head in here, and then him shouting and using the most terrible language into the telephone, and then finding the wires caught, and me following him downstairs, half dead with fright, and he shouts at me, Bella, he shouts, shut those windows, but don't you touch a thing in that room. I'm going for the police. And then he rushes out of the house. I was going to bed, said the cook, picking up her cue for what was probably the twentieth rehearsal of the scene, when I heard Mr. Mittel yell. And Lord, Bella, there he is now. Jimmy Dale's hands clenched. He, too, had caught the scuffle of footsteps, those of three or four men at least, on the front porch. There was one way, only one, of escape, through the French windows. It was a matter of seconds only before Mittel, with the police at his heels, would be in the room, and Jimmy Dale sprang to his feet. There was a wild scream of terror from the maid echoed by another from the cook, and still screaming, both women fled for the door. Mr. Mittel, Mr. Mittel, shrieked the maid. She had flung herself out into the hall. He is back again. Jimmy Dale was at the French windows, tearing at the bolts. They stuck. Shouts came from the front entryway. He wrenched viciously at the fastenings. They gave now. The windows flew open. He glanced over his shoulder. A man, Mitchell presumably, since he was the only one not in uniform, was springing into the room. There was a blur of forms and brass buttons behind Mitchell, and Jimmy Dale leaped to the lawn, speeding across it like a deer. But quick as he ran, Jimmy Dale's brain was quicker, pointing the single chance that seemed open to him. The motorboat. It seemed like a God-given piece of luck that he had noticed it. It was like his own. There would be no blind, and that meant fatal blunders in the dark 
over its mechanism, and he could start it up in a moment, just the time to cast her off. That was all he needed. End of Part 1, Chapter 9b